but uh, why don't we get started with a prayer. And today is the feast day of St. Robert of Newminster. Not a name that's commonly known, but he, he was a monk in the 12th century, uh, a Benedictine, a contemporary of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And his claim to fame among being a saint, he also founded the abbey uh, 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 that was located in uh, England, just north of Leeds, the Fountains Abbey. And um, if you've had a chance to visit there, you'll see the beautiful ruins of that abbey and the nice homes that are made from the stones of the abbey that the Anglicans later built <laughs> out of the ruins of the, of the monastery. But he was a great saint of his time, founding several abbeys uh, in that time in Northumbria, north, northeast England, and then down just north of Leeds for Fountains Abbey, a very famous uh, medieval abbey. So we remember him in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our loving Father, you inspired Robert of Newminster to establish new monasteries and to preside as abbot with gentleness and justice. As we honor today this man of prayer, may we also learn from his example. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This would have been our tenth consecutive program of Summer School of Faith, but we were interrupted one year in 2020 due to the uh, shutdowns that you might have heard of. Uh, but this is our, our tenth year uh, of doing these programs, so uh, it's great to be able to keep something like this going, and as long as you all come, I'll keep coming myself, so I really appreciate that. I thought we'd pick a light subject this summer. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Vatican II, the Council, and its aftermath, which is ongoing, as we know. And uh, I picked this because we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of the start of the Council, which started in October of 1962. The planning for the Council obviously preceded that with John the 23rd announcing the Council in 1959. Uh, but the actual Council started in 1962. And so what we will do is review the major documents of the council, what it actually said, and then how that got developed, perhaps twisted. Uh, and my claim will be throughout that we really haven't implemented the full reach of Vatican II, even in our time. So what we'll do is cover in the next five classes with these dates, we will skip a week in for uh, Independence Day. Uh, but in class one, we'll cover the dogmatic constitution on Revelation, sometimes referred to as Dei Verbum, the constitution on the church, the liturgy, which always draws lots of energy, uh, the constitution on the church in the modern world, and other topics in our last class. You'll note that I also have these little summary statements that I've taken from a work by Matthew Levering, who's a theologian at St. Mary Lake Seminary, to kind of give a, a quick summary of what the document was about. And we'll see what I mean by persons and propositions, true and false reform on the church, active participation in the liturgy was the headline of the document on the liturgy, nature and grace. In this document, the church adopts a new posture, if you will, uh, toward the world away from an isolationist, almost ghetto mentality to an openness to the world which was unprecedented. And some would say astonishingly uh, naive. But we'll get to that. Uh, and then the last class after Independence Day is more of a potpourri class of theological themes of one of the themes in Vatican II is how does doctrine even develop authentically in the first place? That might sound like an obvious question, or it might sound like a, an odd question, but there was true developments that occurred in Vatican II, and we should talk about what constitutes authentic development of sacred tradition and what represents a mutation. 
or a rupture. And we'll spend time on that idea, and then we'll talk about two examples of development of sacred tradition in the document on ecumenism and on religious liberty, which drew a lot of attention at the time and continues to do so. So with this, um, I thought I'd start with a quote from St. Basil, whose feast day is next Thursday, oddly enough. But St. Basil lived in the fourth century, a father of the church, a saint. And I thought that I would read this passage to you to kind of get our juices flowing. He's commenting on the present state of the church after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. You might recall that council. Uh, it's church bell, so that's kind of okay. Uh, but uh, you, you might recall that, that council. It's better than MC Hammer that I heard you playing the other day. Uh, but that council uh, occurred and defined, if you remember, the Nicene Creed that we pray at Mass every Sunday. And in particular, the key expression of how to describe Jesus as define, namely, we say consubstantial today. We used to say one in being with the Father. Now we say consubstantial with the Father in the creed. That's that term that was used in that council. And it was causing controversies and chaos, which would continue for hundreds of years. So here's the passage. To what then shall I liken our present condition? And St. Basil is talking about the condition after Nicaea. It may be compared, I think, to some naval battle, which has arisen out of old-time quarrels and is fought by men who cherish cherish a deadly hate against one another of long experience in naval warfare and eager for the fight. See the rival fleets rushing in dread array to the attack. With a burst of uncontrollable fury, they engage and fight it out. Jealousy of authority and the lust of individual mastery splits the sailors into parties which deal mutual death to one another. Think besides all this of the confused and senseless roar sounding over all the sea from howling winds, from crashing vessels, from boiling surf, from the yells of the combatants as they express their varying emotions in every kind of noise, so that not a word from the admiral or pilot can be heard. The disorder and confusion is tremendous, for the extremity of misfortune when life is despaired of gives men license for every kind of wickedness. Suppose, too, that the men are all smitten with the incurable plague of mad love of glory, so that they do not cease from their struggle each to get the better of the other while their ship is actually settling down into the deep. And that was taken from his work on the Holy Spirit. Now, some bishops and theologians within three to four years of the Vatican II Council ending made the observation that there, if there weren't controversies, they might suspect that the Holy Spirit wasn't present at Vatican II because there have always been controversies after major councils. And if you consider that Vatican II occurred a good 400 years after the Council of Trent, there had been no major statements about uh, doctrine, dogmas, uh, leaving aside the Marian dogmas. Uh, there had been no, quote unquote, updating, you know, accommodating the times authentically. The church continues its search to evangelize the culture it finds itself in. And as we'll see, uh, this had huge implications, especially for a culture in the West that was changing all by itself. It was going through its own disruption. It's interesting, Vatican II occurred at a time where the church in, in Western culture had really a a maximum position of cultural respect and capital to spend, and it did spend. Uh, the, the church, if you think about it at this time, and we'll look at all of the documents in, in a list in a moment, had a very ambitious agenda and wanted to address every aspect of the church's life. This is an unusual position the church had rarely been in, uh, most major councils were addressing specific doctrinal issues. If you go back in time, Vatican I addressing papal infallibility. Council of Trent was very broad and sweeping, but it was fending off Protestant religions. Uh, if you go back further, the councils were very specific, defining different points of doctrine. Vatican II was unique up to this point in addressing 
the broad sweep of how does the church evangelize contemporary culture. A very ambitious agenda. And the church couldn't pull this off if it didn't have the confidence it had in itself of full schools and churches and seminaries, hospitals, uh, respect in culture. Just consider the movies that were made in the 50s and 60s in this country, whether it's Ben-Hur or The Robe or Keys to the Kingdom with Gregory Peck. The, the, the respect Hollywood had for the Catholic Church was significant in contrast to what started happening in the 70s and then continued from there. As I've been hinting at, the church's posture for 400 plus years or more was what I call a defensive crouch vis-a-vis -vis the world, vis-a-vis -vis other religions, vis-a-vis -vis the Enlightenment, uh, and it viewed these movements with radical sus suspicion and uh, a defensive crouch, as I call it, was very present. Uh, but if you think about it, the church had v many good reasons for adopting this posture. If you think about what happened of the wars of religion in the 16th century where Catholic church lands were ransacked and taken by Protestant uh, leaders. Uh, I mentioned, uh, ironically, uh, the founder of Fountains Abbey. Uh, I'm not kidding, when, when my family visited there and our, our descent down to the Abbey, you could see the same, the same stones in the foundations and layers of these wonderful Anglican homes because Henry VIII uh, gave free reign to those uh, princes who were associated with him to ransack those monasteries, take the valuables, and, and build homes. And you can still see those homes to this day. So the church had very good reasons for feeling defensive on, on its back foot vis-a-vis -vis culture and, and the inroads that Protestantism made by force. The French Revolution, uh, where you have uh, really the rise of a godless secularism, uh, and if you've read about the French Revolution, you know of all the atrocities that occurred, whether it was in Notre Dame, uh, uh, vandalizing and, uh, and causing sacrilege there, dumping all of the kings into the Seine, River, there, many were buried there in, in uh, St. Denis, uh, the cathedral there. Uh, you have uh, French troops taking Eucharistic hosts, using them as cadden fodder and shooting them uh, across fields. Uh, you even had Pope Pius VI who was captured by uh, the French and died under the care of Napoleon in, in prison. Uh, so the church had reasons for looking with suspicion at all of these movements. Uh, what has happened up to our time now is what I call the Enlightenment has kind of run its course and has collapsed into kind of what I call a Dewey theism of the divine self now, stripped of any uh, allegiance to the truth, uh, the natural order of things, what is truth in any objective sense? It's my truth, your truth, everyone's truth. And they may coincide, they may not. And so this is where we've kind of collapsed to. Is it's the Dewey theism of the Enlightenment is just kind of like a prick balloon. It's really always been all about us. <laughs> the loss of the Papal States in 1870 uh, created a, more of a defensive uh, reaction in the church as well which was ultimately resolved in 1929 in the Lateran Treaty, leaving the Vatican State as just kind of, of a remnant and no longer relevant in political affairs, which it had become, we could argue, too relevant uh, in its history. I should mention it, Vatican I, which was in 1870, ended prematurely because of the troops that were surrounding uh, Rome at that time, and so the bishops and cardinals skedaddled, and they only were able to define papal infallibility, if you may remember that. The Pope infallible on faith and morals when he declares the doctrine to be held definitively, universally by the entire church. They then had to get out of town. That created an odd papal-centric view of the church for a hundred years. 
people thought they equated the church with whatever the Pope said. Some bishops uh, that were famous and well-known and priests said they preferred to have a papal bull served every morning with their breakfast. Uh, so that what, what began to emerge in the church in the late 19th century out of this defensive crouch of 400 years was this papal-centric understanding of the church, which will be developed and frankly corrected and added to in Vatican II when we talk about the church. So keep that in mind. So back to Vatican II now. Uh, the 1960s started as a decade of optimism. Uh, Europe was climbing out of the ruins of World War II. Uh, there was peace and prosperity for the most part in the West. The Soviet menace has, had been defined. Uh, and obviously there was a Cold War, but uh, there was peace and prosperity for the most part. We had Catholic leaders running major countries. In France, Charles de Gaulle, uh, Conrad Adenauer, a devout Catholic in West Germany, and then we had uh, John F. Kennedy as a Catholic. Uh, and so uh, there was a certain giddiness in 1960 about the prospects for the West. But as the decade progressed, as I mentioned, a, a darkness began to emerge, whether it was the assassinations of Kennedy or Martin Luther King or Robert Kennedy, the civil rights struggle, Vietnam, the rise of the drug hippie culture, uh, the sexual revolution, a huge disruptive force, uh, government policies that destroyed family formation, particularly in major urban settings with the quote unquote war on poverty which was obviously lost. Um, the pill, which came out uh, in, in 1965, a very famous book by a Catholic, in quotes, physician named John Rock, uh, arguing for the use of the pill in marriage to regulate, prevent childbirth. Uh, on and on, the arts, music, literature, all reflecting the mood uh, some wonderful things were produced in this era, of course, uh, but also a darkness uh, continued to assert itself. And if you walk through museums of today, uh, you see this, particularly in the modern uh, museums in, say, New York City or even in downtown Chicago. Uh, it's a moonscape uh, in terms of artistic value, and actually much of it is pornographic. So the arts reflect culture and culture produces uh, the arts. So this cultural tsunami could not but affect the church. Uh, I remember uh, walking the halls of the seminary. I, the pictures still might be up, but in one of the buildings they have the class photos of all the classes going back to when the seminary started. So 1921 maybe was the first class. And they all go every year, a new class. And somewhere around 1969, 70, the haircuts get really bad, the sideburns get really long, beards, uh, kind of the weird grin. Uh, <laughs> and and it, it's interesting, you, you have military style haircuts all through the 40s and 50s, 60s, and then somewhere 69, 70, you know, it's like if you were just visiting from another planet, you'd say, what, what happened to the grooming? <laughs> well, the 60s happened. <laughs> so um, we'll continue then. Uh, in case, uh, and I think we, we've got a group here that is uh, on average older than the eighth graders that were in here earlier. Uh, but many of you live through this directly uh, and not just by um, reputation or you read a story about it. But this is the impact of the, the tsunami of the 1960s. And I won't dwell on this too much other than if you look at the decline from 1970, and this started probably 1968 actually, uh, a 41% drop over the last 50 plus years. Uh, and, and those, it's obvious, but it gets more interesting. In religious orders, the drop was much more precipitous and extreme. Uh, and if you think about it from a, from a demonic, diabolical point of view, if you're going to destroy the church, you're going to start with the infantry. 
You're going to start with the, the troops on the ground. You're going to start with religious sisters and brothers who are teaching children, who are staffing the schools, who are staffing the hospitals, who are staffing the food pantries, and you're going to nail it. And that's exactly what happened. And in fact, again, the decline started in 1967. If you look at the data from the official Catholic directory, religious orders started shedding members for the first time in their histories in the late 60s. You know, again, this is gloomy, uh, but if you, and this is all in your, your deck if you receive this. Um, interesting, the Catholic population has increased. Adult converts has increased. Uh, former Catholics have increased significantly. Uh, Foreign-born uh, adults have increased significantly from the different countries that are feeding the U.S. population. Uh, so... This data is mixed in many ways, uh, but uh, still the trend isn't great. If you look at education, as I was referring to earlier, again, not to dwell on this, but primary school children in religious ed. This could be whether they're attending a public school or a Catholic school, supplemental. You see these tremendous drops in every category. Uh, interestingly, it, when you get to universities, there's an increase in the number of students at Catholic universities but that's largely due to the fact those universities have abandoned their charters. Uh, they might be Catholic in name only. They might not even be Catholic in their mission statements anymore. Baptism, just another, uh, and again, not to focus on the gloom, but this is the naval battle that we've all been through. And any discussion of Vatican II that doesn't recognize what happened isn't going to be credible. Uh, and so... Uh, baptisms have gone down. Now, 21 was a COVID year, certainly, but the, the trend obviously was not great. Marriages, 21 was a COVID year, not great. Clergy abuse, this is often misunderstood, uh, but based upon the abuse when the year it occurred, not when it was later reported by the claimant, the vast majority occurred in the 70s. In fact, when the Diocese of Joliet, as part of its uh, compliance with state law, had to release the ordination dates of the offenders. The vast majority were from the, from the 1950s. Everyone thinks this abuse was something recent. Oh, it was those liberal priests of the 80s. Uh, no, it wasn't. These were men formed in the pre-Vatican II era. They said the Tridentine Mass every week. So uh, it's just interesting to look at the data. So as we get to it, why did Pope John, St. John the 23rd, call a council in the first place? We talked about what I, this pressure cooker of the last 400 years of not addressing issues that had been building up in society, in the natural sciences. Was Darwin ever directly addressed in any official Catholic statement at any length? Not particularly. Was Marx addressed other than being part of atheism? But was there any discussion of what attracted people to Marxism at a deep philosophical level in the first place? Not particularly. There were papal statements about the evils of Marxism and atheistic communism. But anything at length addressing the literature of communism or the other arts? Not particularly. So the church had kind of isolated and ghettoized itself. Uh, it was speaking to itself in many ways. We had two massive attempts at suicide in the West in the 20th century. World War I, World War II, fought in largely Catholic Christian countries. Can we go on with business as usual, with tens of millions of people killed in those wars, with carnage never seen before? Do we just continue? John the 23rd didn't think so, and many others like him didn't either. So as John the 23rd thought about it, he wanted to speak these ageless truths of Catholicism in a time 
that would be in language and concepts that would speak to that culture, our culture, without compromising those ageless truths of faith. So how did John put it? He put it this way in, in the quote, uh, in the address to the council. There we go. The major interest of the ecumenical council is this. The sacred heritage of Christian truth be safeguarded and expounded with greater efficacy. What is needed and what everyone imbued with a truly Christian, Catholic, and apostolic spirit craves today is that this doctrine shall be more widely known, more deeply understood, and more penetrating in its effect on men's moral lives. What is needed is that this certain and immutable doctrine to which the faithful owe obedience be studied afresh and reformulated in contemporary terms. For this deposit of faith or truths which are contained in our time-honored teaching is one thing. The manner in which these truths are set forth with their meaning preserved intact is something else. So we have the truth of our faith and the manner in which it is expressed. And those two things can be distinguished even though there are time-honored expressions of our faith, which in many ways are immorialized and, and we have never improved on them. You know, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God and man. Uh, we're not likely going to improve on those statements anytime soon. Uh, but that's what uh, John the 23rd was after. These are the major, I should say, these are all of the documents of Vatican II. The constitutions are the weighty, significant, often with higher teaching authority uh, than decrees and declarations. Why is that? Because the constitutions, particularly the dogmatic constitutions, are not just articulating Catholic principles of faith, but they're developing them in definitive ways. The general constitution on the liturgy uh, doesn't have the same dogmatic weight because it's dealing with practices of the liturgy. The theology that informs it has weight, but the adoption of the different methods by which the liturgy can be celebrated, for example, in the vernacular, is not really a dogmatic question in the first place. The church in the modern world makes use of Catholic principles, for example, the, the Catholic principles in, in our social teaching, uh, and, and is a, adapting them and applying them to the world that the church knew in the 1960s. So to the extent it's based upon conjectural opinions or contingent facts, the application of those principles can change in a way that the principles or the doctrine of the Trinity does not if you follow me. So if, if we're talking about, for example, uh, climate change, uh, any statements by popes or bishops on climate change will be contingent on the facts they're assuming. You see how that is a different level. It's not dogmatic, in other words. It's more prudential. Whereas the principle of being a steward of creation is a dogmatic principle, that God has entrusted humanity with the care of our planet which we would all agree. So you see the difference. As I mentioned, decrees and declarations have, you can tell they're much more historical and contingent. We will spend time on ecumenism and religious freedom because they're very spicy <laughs> and controversial. Some people left the church over the decree on religious freedom and formed another church. With everything aside, and we'll cover this first bullet in class two at greater length, the heart of Vatican II is the universal call to holiness. This is what the church is for. The church, if she produces smart people, is that a good thing? Of course that's a good thing. If she produces people that are successful in business or the sciences, arts and literature, is that a good thing? That's a great thing. But if the church doesn't produce holy people, it, the church is a failure. And so Vatican II, the heart of the council, is this universal call to holiness, every one of us, not just for religious 
not just for clergy, but for all, laity included. Out of this concept will build many things that we'll see in the church in the modern world constitution that holy people produce holy families, holy families produce holy societies, holy societies produce great countries, and so on. But we'll spend time on that in class two and then in class four. I mentioned earlier the development of doctrine. We'll spend a lot more time on this one in class number five. It's one of those issues that was hovering around the council at all times. How does doctrine authentically develop? without jeopardizing the faith? How do we speak to a contemporary culture that is veering toward godlessness uh, in a vocabulary of their own? How do we reach that? And it's, a, and it's a very good question. So we'll spend a lot of time on it in class five. The other thing I would mention is, and we went through the, the metrics of decline in clergy, baptisms, marriage, and so forth. If you think that a couple thousand men gathered in Rome were the cause of that, you, you, you were ascribing a lot of power to bishops. <laughs> and it doesn't explain why the Protestant religions experienced the same decline. So there's often this simplistic, well, if Vatican II hadn't happened, we wouldn't have had that decline. That's not very persuasive to me uh, given what was happening in the culture already and given the declines that were occurring in the other religions. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit too simplistic and one could even argue the reverse, that the declines would have been worse without uh, Vatican II. So we'll, we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, but Vatican II did not cause uh, the sexual revolution, as, as some might think. So the key point before I move on is how Vatican II was implemented by highly fallible clerics is very different than what the documents called for. Very different at times. Perhaps more than we want to think. Now in your deck, I have moved some slides around that I'm going to treat in a future class because we just don't have time uh, in this class. So. I wanted to mention one other thing then before we dive in, which is something unique again to Vatican II, which is the media. So at the Council of Trent, there wasn't uh, ABC News or CNN or MSNBC uh, attempting to capture a soundbite that might work for a perspective they want to promote. Everything we know about the Council of Trent is captured in the documents and on histories that were written at the time. Uh, and unlike the Council of Trent, Vatican II had a huge media presence and willing collaborators in the clergy, theologians and bishops who would leak to them and would leak uh, misinformation as well to affect how the council would be received. And this happened from the beginning and you, you can see why the church leaders would be caught short by this. That they weren't ready for the, the, the level of subterfuge, of chaos that was being sown even while the council was in session. And so terms that came out of the council like dialogue uh, or pastoral solutions or people of God, which is in the text on the church. Was, it's one of seven expressions but it, it apparently was the only expression that people wanted to talk about because it had a non-hierarchical connotation. If we're all people of God, we all have the same authority, and a pope isn't going to tell me what I think because I have my own belief as a Catholic. This was common currency in the air during the council even. Autonomy, freedom of conscience, the decree on religious liberty was used to say, well, Catholics have religious liberty too within the church. When in point of fact, the decree on religious liberty was about freedom of worship for all religious people vis-a-vis -vis secular authority. It had nothing to do with a Catholic's obligations as a Catholic in the church. Twisted. The Eucharist, the, the, the notion of Eucharist as meal has an authentic aspect to it. We'd all agree. We are nourished by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But it wasn't the only image used in the document on the liturgy. Uh, the liturgy is first and foremost the sacrifice of Calvary on our altars. The holy sacrifice of the Mass, which the document on the liturgy talked about but totally obscured by the press releases around it. So I could go on and on about this, uh, the gathered community, which you still hear in our, our talk today in homilies, uh, the gathered community this, the gathered community that, uh, as if the sole purpose of Mass was for the community to gather. <laughs> so all of these were slogans that came through the popular press that did not have the agenda of presenting what the council was teaching. And so this got into the bloodstream. This got into the consciousness of people about, oh, this is what the church teaches now. Just a brief bi bibliography. I would like to point out uh, two texts. This introduction to Vatican II by Matthew Levering, who's a professor at Seminary Lake Seminary, is very good. Uh, it has both a historical aspect and a theological depth to it, which you will enjoy. The other one is Father Blake Britton, who's associated with uh, Bishop Barron, uh, and has a wonderful book from the perspective of a pastor who has turned around parishes that were financially in trouble, no one attending Mass, to financial surpluses and full attendance at Mass, uh, and he talks about how he implemented Vatican II in those parishes. So you get an implementer's perspective, not just a theological perspective. I should mention by 1968, with the student riots in Europe, uh, the jig was up for many of the leading experts at Vatican II, Pope Benedict uh, being one of them. As an expert at the council, and many like him, uh, Henri de Lubac, Eve Congar, uh, even Han Urs von Balthasar, all of these innovators whose thinking and writing was reflected in the text of Vatican II, by 1968, they had seen the chaos and they said, we've got to reel this back in. And in many ways, it was too late. So this didn't get its second... Re I, I remember reading this when I was a student in the uh, early 80s. But there wasn't a reprint of this until Ignatius Press in the early 90s. It was just ignored for like 20 plus years. It's a fantastic uh, book. So let me move then to the theology that Dei Verbum was after, the, uh, the, the, the constitution on revelation that we're now going to talk about. So I, uh, I brought with me a catechism from 1876. I got this at a used bookshop several years ago. And um, I want to make a contrast with what I say here, which is up to Vatican II, uh, the church's teaching style was clarity. Uh, it was clear. Everyone knew what we believed as Catholics. Absolutely. And you might remember that my header for this section was persons and propositions. And you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. But the Baltimore Catechism, you have a copy, I have a copy. It's dog-eared, it's worn. I, I love reading it over. Uh, and it emphasizes clarity. And you know what the faith is when you read that. Let me read uh, from, this is a, a, it's entitled, A Full Catechism of the Catholic Religion. And uh, the copyright is 1876 in New York. And uh, there's even some prayer cards here from like 1883. Uh, but here's how it starts. And trust me, all the catechisms that were regional before the Baltimore Catechism was, was started in 1885, it drew from, you can see the influence of this catechism on the Baltimore Catechism. The opening chapter is on the end of man. For what end are we in the world? Answer. We are in this world that we may know God, love him, and serve him, and thereby attain heaven. Next question. What is heaven? Heaven is a place of eternal and perfect happiness. Next question. Are not then the things of this world intended to make us happy? Answer. No. The things of this world cannot possibly make us happy. Why cannot the things of this world make us happy? Because all earthly things are vain and perishable. And because man is made for God, 
and for everlasting happiness. And so there are, it just goes on in questions like this. And then it'll go to the sacraments, it'll go to the commandments, it'll go to the virtues. It has the advantage of being concise. But it, it's missing something, isn't it? It's, it's missing uh, a culture that may not respond to that method of instruction. This is an instruction where you're already preaching to the choir, so to speak. I already have you captive. You're in the ghetto with me. You're just ignorant, and we can remedy that. And so are we evangelizing a secular culture with this kind of approach? And the answer is probably not. This has clarity. It's suitable for children, certainly. But the culture isn't just peopled with children. It's, it's peopled with people who have real questions, real doubts about many things that are fundamental. So, as I put here, faith as conceptual instruction of propositions and less as discipleship based on a summons from a person who is truth and love. That's a little different approach, isn't it? Person. And theologians, particularly in the German Romantic movement of the 19th century and early 20th century, began writing in these terms of what is the exact sequence here? Uh, do we believe a person and then what they say? Do you believe what anyone tells you? Do we not, in our own uh, experience of belief, first come to a person who we trust and love and then we listen to what they have to say and believe it. Especially in a culture that is losing faith, uh, it may not be as convincing arguments from the jump or formulas from the catechism in question and answer form. Is not a person behind that summons of faith that we feel in our gut? And so this is the first headline from the document on Revelation. That Revelation, the Word of God, is first the person of Jesus Christ. And as Catholics, we've always felt a little uncomfortable with this kind of talk. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? We hear that from you know, the evangelical preachers. And we're, we're kind of like, well, that's kind of ham-fisted, to put it that way, isn't it? That's kind of gaudy, and you're embarrassing me. Stop it. You know, well... Wait a minute, though. Aren't they on to something? Will you die for a proposition? Will you die for an argument? Will you love an argument? So there's this disconnect that seemed to have emerged over the centuries about persons and propositions. So the headlines from the document are, Revelation is for someone telling you something. Sounds obvious. But you'll listen to the message after you're convinced of the someone. And that someone is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to listen to him. In fact, it's a full-on encounter, especially if I witness miracles. He did stuff that made me believe in him. He didn't, I didn't believe in him based on what he said. I believed on, in him because he made the paralytic walk. He raised Lazarus. He rose from the dead. That's what our faith is based on. So as I put here, we act our way and think our way into belief. And as I mentioned right above it, the propositions, the catechetical formulations are helpful because the more I know, the more I will love that person. But I have to start with the person that I love. And then I want to know more about him. Each of you who are married, hopefully you are interested in your spouse's family. Did you say, no, I don't want to meet them? That's, they're not you. you. You get to know them better through their family, doing things together. Uh, you get insights because you love them. And so knowledge deepens love. It's not opposed to it. But we don't equate love and knowledge either. You love your children. Do you love a picture of them? 
well, it reminds you of them, so you have photo albums and so on, but the picture is not your child. If the police knocked on your door and said, your child is missing, we need a photo to find them, would you say, no, you can't have it. I'd rather have my picture. No, because the picture is about portraying the child. It's not the child. Theology, doctrinal statements, are not Jesus Christ. Obviously, they're words on a page. They're knowledge about Jesus Christ. But would you hold on to your books as, I'm not giving them up. No, you, you love a person. Theology makes that love grounded, anchored in the truth. If we love a false image of God, we haven't advanced we, and we're not truly loving God. So I'm not talking about mindless love. I'm just talking about a base reality of revelation is from a person whom we love and we want to know more about. And that was missing in the catechisms. The the document then spends lots of time on what is the relationship then if, if revelation is from a person who we love, he has spoken to us. How has he spoken to us? Through sacred scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and through the sacred tradition of the church in every age, clarifying a point of faith and morals definitively. And there's this other aspect called the teaching magisterium, which we will now get into. But the, the headline here is that we breathe from two lungs. We're not people of the book only. We don't even say the book was found in a forest or was dictated to an individual in separation from a community with no communal verification. The last point which the document describes, which we'll read about in a moment, is that the Old and New Testament are a work of sacred tradition. Obviously, they're a work of the apostles and the communities associated with the apostles. Sacred scripture didn't just fall out of the sky. We don't even have copies of the original manuscripts from the hand of the writer. What we have are translations and editions. So to, to, we'll get to this more, but to claim that my faith is based upon the Bible implies, well, your faith is based upon the institution that put the Bible together. Also emphasize the use of scripture in the liturgy, which we'll talk about in class three. Here's a passage from this introduction to Christianity by Pope Benedict when he was then just uh, Father Ratzinger teaching in Germany. But it emphasizes this point of the I and the thou. Uh, and here we go, which is namely that revelation and our response in faith is a dialogue. Are you really he? This question was asked anxiously in a dark hour even by John the Baptist, the prophet who had directed his disciples to the rabbi from Nazareth and recognized him as the greater for whom he could only prepare the way. Are you really he? The believer will repeatedly experience the darkness in which the negation of belief surrounds him, like a gloomy prison from which there is no escape, and the indifference of the world, which goes its way unchanged, as if nothing had happened, seems only to mock his hope. We have to pose the question, are you really he? Not only through honesty of thought and because of reason's responsibility, but also in accordance with the intrinsic law of love, which wants to know more and more him to whom it has given its yes, so as to be able to love him more. Are you really he? In the last resort, all the reflections contained in this book are subordinate to the, this question and thus revolve around the basic form of confession. I believe in you, Jesus of Nazareth, as the meaning of the world and of my life. So how did the council talk about revelation? From the second paragraph, in his goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of his will, by which through Christ the word made flesh, man might in the Holy Spirit 
have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. Through this revelation, therefore, the invisible God, out of the abundance of his love, speaks to men as friends and lives among them so that he may invite and take them into fellowship with himself. See the style here? Very different than the catechism that I just read from with the, the under the hot lights Q&A. <laughs> See how this is different writing that God calls us as friends. This plan of revelation is re realized by deeds and words. Not just propositions, but actions. Having an inner unity. The deeds wrought by God in the history of salvation manifest and confirm the teaching and realities signified by the words, while the words proclaim the deeds and clarify the mystery contained in them. By this revelation, then, the deepest truth about God and the salvation of man shines out for our sake in Christ, who is both the mediator and the fullness of all revelation. So, the, the whole schema of the document is God speaks a word. In the beginning was the word. The logos in Greek, where our word logical comes from, or all the ologies come from, theology, biology, zoology, study of, the rationality of God is first. Interesting in literature, uh, if you remember the Faustus, Faustian myth of Goethe, uh, an 18th century German romantic poet, in the beginning was the deed, action, power. Did the church start engaging German romantic literature in the 18th century? It was starting. What was starting? The glide to secularism. In the beginning is not order, not the word, not rationality, but power. These themes will be taken up. People who read this and take it seriously and want to do something about it will characterize the 19th century and the 20th century, and they are not a friend of humanity. So, in the beginning was the word. God speaks a word. This word becomes flesh and comes and teaches and ultimately performs a redemptive act of rising from the dead. Victory over sin and death. The word, that word, sends the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, which we just celebrated at Pentecost. That Holy Spirit then launches the apostolic mission of the church and so on. We are evangelized face to face. When we talk about adoration, which is the heart of the liturgy, there's a Latin word for prayer, orare, ora, uh, which has an earlier derivation from mouth. We are mouth to mouth with God in adoration. We are face to face to God in revelation. A God without conceptual content is unknowable and therefore unlovable. As I said last year in the class on Buddhism, no one loves Buddhism. You endure Eastern mysticism. You don't love it. You might go into hot yoga feeling great. You leave droopy and sweaty. And, <laughs> and a God who is not a person is unlovable and then in the end not really worth knowable. At the end of Philip Marlowe's Faust, when he had made the deal with the devil to become a successful university professor, at the end, when the devil is taking him away, he says, take my books. <laughs> He's still negotiating. So in the end, his love of knowledge even is, when it gets right down to it, He's, if you take my books, can I stay? <laughs> so there's a subjective element and an objective element to our faith. There's a subjective appropriation, our response to this encounter with a person, the divine person of God in Jesus Christ. But he also has plans for us. And so there's objective content to what he would like us to know in faith and do. So what am I getting at? The subjective element 
is the divine thou that confronts, encounters, summons all of us in the garden of our conscience. There's no escaping it. God can run faster than we can run away. <laughs> in fact, he pursues us and we, more times than not, are in flight. So that's the subjective encounter that we all have with a person. If I break a speeding law coming over here, how bad do I feel about that? Because is that hurting a person? Not particularly. If I kick someone in the shin, I, I'll feel bad about that because I hurt a person. So behind law and the twinge of conscience when we violate the law, a commandment, a law of morality, there always stands a person, unlike traffic laws or keep off the grass signs. So what's the objective element? The objective element is the content of faith as proclaimed by the church. In her councils, in her catechisms, in her teachings, the things that we are asked to believe as Catholics. That's the objective element. And Pope Francis recognized this. <coughs> From his first encyclical, Lumen, everyone forgets he had a first encyclical before uh, the others that followed. Uh, he was, and he was actually finishing an encyclical that Pope Benedict had started. Uh, but in any event, quote, it is impossible to believe on our own. Faith is not simply an individual decision which takes place in the depths of the believer's heart, nor a completely private relationship between the eye of the believer and the divine thou, between an autonomous subject and God. By its very nature, faith is open to the we of the church. This is really the authentic sense of community. It always takes place within her communion. Pope Francis Lumen Fidei. Now these tensions, these two poles, these two elements are always in tension in our culture uh, and how things develop coming out of the council. But getting down then to concrete now, the council talked about sources of revelation uh, safeguards of divine revelation, and it laid out a schema of really three pieces to this. They're all working together. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the teaching magisterium of the church. These are the things that we're assenting to when we say we believe. These are the things that we are saying ground my faith. Sacred Scripture, which we identify as the Old and New Testament. The Council of Trent actually called out a version of the Bible, the uh, Latin Vulgate of St. Jerome. There are other authentic translations of that as well now. Uh, sacred Tradition, which are the 21 ecumenical councils, speaking on points of faith and morals. And the Teaching Magisterium of the Church. As I mentioned earlier on the right panel here, Bible-only faiths really are cutting themselves off from the living, spirit-guided, sacred tradition of the church by claiming to be Bible-only, when in fact the truth is they're relying on the apostolic succession and those churches in communion with it that formed, edited, and put together the 27 books of the New Testament. You might recall from earlier classes there are hundreds of different versions of the Gospels. There's the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Matthew, different versions of Matthew, different versions of John that don't agree with each other on key points. Gospel of Jude, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Barnabas. Who picked the 27 books? Who picked the four Gospels that we have? Who picked the versions of the four Gospels that we have? And by the way, we have no original from the hand of the author. So you see the you can't have a Bible without having some implicit, perhaps unstated claim in your belief system of the institution that put it together had to be protected by the Holy Spirit because if it wasn't, then what's your guarantee that they picked the right Gospels? <laughs> Why didn't they pick the Shepherd of Hermas? It's older. The Didache was written in 50 AD, probably before Paul started writing. Why didn't it make it? It's older. It didn't make it. Someone selected it out. It appears on certain lists in the first century, second century, you see it. 
certain canons, but it took bishops with apostolic su succession saying it's these four Gospels, St. Irenaeus being the most obvious example, Bishop Leon, 170 AD. So Bible-only faiths are actually resting on, relying on the Catholic apostolic succession. And the document points this out. So I've been talking a long time. I thought we might need a brief little uh, intermezzo. But uh, I thought you might enjoy this. And at least it's a palate cleanser uh, from a slide that has lots of bullet points on it. But it's a picture of perhaps someone in a Protestant camp, summer camp, saying, right here is where our movement came along and got the Bible right. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> okay. So, one last quote from the document, which describes the format of which I just covered. Hence, there exists a close connection and communication between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. For both of them, flowing from the same divine wellspring, in a certain way merge into a unity and tend toward the same end. For sacred scripture is the word of God inasmuch as it is consigned to the writing under the inspiration of the divine spirit. So it's privileged. While sacred tradition takes the word of God entrusted by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit to the apostles and hands it on to their successors in its full purity so that led by the light of the spirit of truth they may in proclaiming it preserve this word of God faithfully, explain it, and make it more widely known. Consequently, it is not from sacred scripture alone that the church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. Therefore, both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of loyalty and reverence. So after Vatican II, we had tons of Bible studies, a wonderful thing, a fantastic thing. And yet there wasn't the same energy around sacred tradition studies even hard to say. <laughs> Another example of Vatican II being ignored. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. Holding fast to this deposit, the entire holy people united with their shepherds remain always steadfast in the teaching of the apostles, in the common life, in the breaking of the bread, and in prayers, so that holding to, practicing, and professing the heritage of the faith it becomes on the part of the bishops and faithful a single common effort. So that's the wind-up. Now here's the pitch. But the task of authentically interpreting the Word of God, whether written or handed on, has been entrusted exclusively to the living teaching office of the church, whose authority is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what I meant by magisterium, which is a big Latin word meaning teacher. This teaching office is not above the word of God. The model coming out of Vatican I was the Pope was kind of the custodian of something in a briefcase. <laughs> and in point of fact, what we're reading here is this teaching office is not above the word of God, but serves it. <coughs> teaching only what has been handed on, listening to it devoutly, guarding it scrupulously and explaining it faithfully. In accord with divine commission and with the help of the Holy Spirit, it draws from this one deposit of faith everything which it prevents for belief as divinely revealed. No mere human wisdom, no mere opinion, divinely revealed. To finish, it is clear, therefore, that sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the church, in accord with God, God's most wise design, are so linked and joined that one cannot stand without the others, and that all together, and each in its own way, under the action of one Holy Spirit, contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. Tradition is another word from Latin meaning to hand on, to hand over where our word traitor comes from, someone who hands someone else over. But tradition, in the pure sense of the word, is a handing on and deepening in every age that it finds itself in 
of that one unchangeable faith that is immutable throughout time. And as Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II said, our faith and theology begins and ends on our knees in prayer and wonder for what he, God, has done for us. It goes back to what he did for us, rising from the dead. The Logos, the Word of God, comes to earth, assumes a human nature, teaches, preaches, suffers, dies, and rises. That truth of our faith is where we begin and end on our knees, as St. John Paul II wrote. So that's what I had for tonight. Uh, the, the key point to take away is that revelation is not merely catechetical instruction, but it is an encounter with a person who calls us to a deeper relationship with him. And the problem with this being fully absorbed is in the aftermath of Vatican II, the religious education of young people uh, faded away. So that even hearing this today is hard because the educational system is so poor now that we, we need a little more catechism <laughs> because we don't even know the what on a basic level. But you see what the council was after in the 1960s from a position of confidence People knew their faith back then. Let's not forget the person behind what the faith is. But in the tsunami that happened after the council, all of this got washed out to sea. People don't even know what anymore. They're very much into the subjective. How do I feel? How do I feel about that doctrine? Thank you. No, no, no thank you on that. Oh, thank you there, yes. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, and so the subjective element is in high form now. But the latest Pew research, uh, which stunned, I think, people, certainly stunned Bishop Barron, uh, they surveyed church-going Catholics and non-church-going Catholics. So the survey found that 50% of people who were baptized Catholic didn't think the real presence in the Eucharist was a teaching of the church, or true. He said, well, okay, those are people who have been away from the faith. Maybe they never had a religious education. Then they surveyed weekly mass attendees. Guess what the percentage was of, of belief in the real presence in the Eucharist? 41%. 59% don't believe in the real presence who are in the pews every week. 59%. So this message of Vatican II is an important message that we're, we're still climbing out of the na naval battle, out of the rubble. And just knowing what is the faith uh, needs to be reemphasized. We've got the personal dimension down. We, we do nothing but therapy of the self these days. <laughs> we got that nailed. As the child once said, do I always get to do what I want to? <laughs> and, and so too, uh, we need content today, would be my corrective or adder to Vatican II, is that yes, discipleship is that personal walk with Jesus Christ. But we would be kidding ourselves and ignoring the last 50 years if we didn't also recognize that we need authentic, catechetical instruction. So that's the document. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I've done a lot of talking, so it's time to turn over to the Q&A. So anyone have comments or questions? <laughs>